You're listening to Discovering Truth with Dan Duvall. Well, folks, welcome back to another episode of Discovering Truth with Dan Duvall. I am very excited this week. I'm going to be having a very fun conversation with a friend and mentor of mine. His name is Bishop Hugh Smith, and he is an apostolic father to many, as well as an international speaker. Now, for those of you that were with us in the spring during our Bride Tribe advance at that time, you would have had the pleasure of meeting him because we brought him in as our guest. Now, Bishop Smith serves as a consultant to pastors and leaders around the world, He is the founder and executive director of Justice Network, a nonprofit social justice organization, and is a trained civil civil mediator who specializes in restorative justice practices. He's a member of the American International Christian Chaplain Association and is the founder of the Diamond Leadership Academy. He is also the senior pastor of Embassy Covenant Church. You can find him at www.hughdanielsmith.com. Bishop Smith, welcome to Discovering Truth with Dan Duvall. Thank you, Dan. I'm so excited and happy to be on the program with you. It's been a long time. I've been looking forward to this. Well, you know, I've been looking forward to it a long time as well. And folks, what you need to know is that Bishop Smith has actually helped me a lot personally. Um, I am one of those pastors and leaders around the world that he has sown into <laughs> with uh, his extraordinary wisdom. Uh, he helped me to actually overcome a lot of issues I was having with my own identity as a leader in the body of Christ, uh, put order into our organization here at Bride Ministries. And he was also the mastermind behind my premarital counseling, which both Christian and I have a lot to thank him for. So (laughs) thank you, Dr. Bishop Smith. And, um, you know, as we get into this program, uh, we already kind of got a head start and then realized we weren't recording. (laughs) So we're going to just jump right back in where we kind of left off. But, but I want to start on governance, right? Because, because you have so much to say on this subject and its importance to our lives. So can you just begin by cracking that open? What is governance, right governance, and why is it important? Well, first of all, Dan, let me say this. Anything that is left to its own devices will bring one to shame. We have a verse in the Bible that uh, affirms that. You leave a child child to himself, he'll bring his parents to shame. Everything has a head on it. You know, I've got one, you've got one. Uh, (laughs) Without a head, then you have a body without direction. And so right governance, as far as I'm concerned, has to do with creating the right kind of government or headship or atmosphere around a project or environment that allows for manifestation, that allows for structure and order and peace is what it's really about. Um, Justice or just rule will bring about a peaceful environment. And so how we govern really determines what happens on the ground level. I think what's happening on the ground level is a reflection of the governance. And so we can never blame uh, the congregation or the or the citizens of a city for the state of affairs, I think everything stops and starts with leadership and governance. Um, You may have a few exceptions to that rule, but for the most part, uh, he that has that position to rule is grooming or as a hen sitting and, and as Paul put it, travailing until something is birthed or something is managed. And so governance or right governance, as the Bible terms it, determines the peace and the quality of any body that lives up under it. Goodness. Okay. So um, there are a lot of organizations that lack peace and stability. Uh, and, and, And there are a lot of people that know they have a capacity, even a, a gifting that deserves to be released at a larger scale or level, but it's not. Let's talk about governance in that context. You know, uh, we talked about when we first got on here, uh, how gifts um, or how we have to distinguish leadership or governance from one's natural endowment or from one's gift that God has given them. 
an individual can cook a hamburger well, but it doesn't mean that they can run a business. And I've run into so many people that are very gifted in their specified area, but they're very miserable and fruitless because they have not uh, managed the environment around them. They have not uh, what I would call ran the business of their ministry well. And that takes leadership, that takes governance, and it's a different muscle altogether. Uh, for years, I was trained to preach and teach. When you go to theology school, they teach you how to put a sermon together and things like that. And you perfect that over the years, but that doesn't mean you're going to do well in ministry. <laughs> it doesn't mean that at all. Uh, I had to learn afterwards that, no, I have to learn how to lead and govern and create the kinds of environments that people want to live in, number one, that people want to occupy and that will allow them to flourish and become everything that they ought to be. So governance to me is that umbrella that causes everything up under it to flourish. It is the grooming and the nurturing that activates the nature that's inside that God has given. So if nature is not exploding, if gifts are not being unwrapped, it's an issue of the nurturing process, which is governance. Goodness gracious. All right. So, so you got a lot of people, right. that are going to listen to this. Right. And they're in a rut. Bishop Smith. I mean, qu quite frankly, they have a business idea. It's not working. They got a family idea. That's not working either. <laughs> they have relationship ideas, <laughs> right. It's not working out. And, um, you know, everybody wants to blame the devil which sometimes, you know, he throws a wrench in the engine and we talk about that. But uh, let, let, let's talk about governance and, and how uh, people miss this in their business, their family, their relationships. You know, Dan, um, you've probably heard of this before, but I think it's applicable for this today. The 80-20 rule, Mm. which simply says we should take 20% uh, of the things that we're trying to do yeah. and give it 80% of our time. And when I first started in ministry and leadership and things like that, I was trying to do everything that was in my vision. And I had a lot in my vision. So I had all these cups out here, <laughs> but I only had enough time to put a drop here and a drop there and a drop here. And it took a long time to move things forward because I had so many things I was trying to do. It wasn't until I decided to take 80% of my time and target 20% of the things that I was trying to do that I was able to get some things off the ground. So the principle that I'm trying to extrapolate here is that it takes time to govern. You can't govern uh, you know, as an afterthought. <laughs> you have to actually sit down and be strategic and put things in place. I mean, think about God. Um, in the book of Genesis, before he put man in that garden, he fixed everything that the man could need, want, require to be successful. You can't hold a person accountable for something if you didn't give them everything they need to be successful. And some leaders are holding people accountable for an outcome when they haven't provided the tools to succeed. And for me, that's abuse of government. That's expecting something that's that's reaping where you have been sown that's what the guy who had the one talent said about god we know you're a harsh guy and you're going to reap where you have been sown but the reality is if i'm governing i have to provide everything that's necessary for individuals in that environment to succeed in order for it to be a just environment and 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 give me the ability to hold people accountable you know that that is that is so deep and then this was actually a big problem for me. I was, folks, I was governing Bride Ministries as an afterthought for years and wondering why things kept imploding all over the place. Thank God for Christian, Bishop Smith. Things are not imploding anymore. But it, what you're saying is so valid. And, and I, I think this is a, a, a piece that a lot of people miss. And why don't people have more intentionality about taking the time to build something right? I, I think it's because we're so enamored with our own gift 
and our and our ability to do certain things that we haven't understood the value of what we're encasing it in and the context that we're building around it we have many times that hasn't been explained it took me years to see that uh for myself but but now i do understand that it you know if i'm planning a project as far as my time budget is concerned the bulk of the time budget goes to governance and the gift is going to make certain things happen but if i can create an atmosphere for something to flourish in um i think i'm more apt to be effective and successful than just producing the product um, it simply takes time daniel and i think we have to allocate the time to to have the meetings you know the the, the boring meetings that people don't like to be in and to put policies together and build infrastructure. I mean, when you go outside there in Dallas and you look around and you see all the infrastructure and you go to an airport and somebody's thought about, um, you know, we got thousands of people running through this airport and yet everybody can get where they're trying to go and nobody's leading them. That tells me somebody sat down and thought about all the possible scenarios. That's governance. Every need that a person may have in that airport was figured out before we got there. So we can self-manage because somebody was governing. And one of the reasons that some people have to micromanage is because they haven't governed. If you don't govern, you have to micromanage every piece in there and you can only do so much any given day and you're gonna get tired, you're gonna get frustrated with people and you're gonna always be in conflict with people because you're micromanaging. I think we need to govern so people can learn how to self-manage. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. And, and you know, I'll, I'll tell you, that is so good. Now, some people really like to micromanage. I don't, Daniel. I really don't. <laughs> let's, just, let's just talk about that for a minute, though, because you say, you know, all right. So the goal is not micromanagement. Why do you think some people really, really gravitate towards micromanaging other people? I think people who don't have a respect for other human beings uh -oh. i think people who don't believe in other human beings and that's what we're going to talk about in just a minute because there's things i want to say about that um have the tendency to micromanage they, they they don't trust they don't delegate well and they haven't built a structure that will help people self-manage so if i don't build a structure and then i don't trust other people mm. and i have control issues Oh and all God. of that, the tendency is to micromanage. So that thing can spin way out of control, especially with control issues. If, you know, I think I'm the only one that can make it happen and all of those kinds of things. And if it's really about me, you know, if I'm the centerpiece of it all anyway, then I'm going to put my hand in everything and not develop other people's gifts. And so the whole thing is perverted and corrupted by that time when you see too much micromanaging. God has gifted people to represent him in the earth and surely they should be able to do some things. I mean, think about a McDonald's. You can get a 15-year-old to work at McDonald's, a 16-year-old, and they can go there and they can work at McDonald's and do well and close out and all of that. And that same 16-year-old can't do anything at church or in somebody else's business because there's no structure. At McDonald's, there are certain things that are organized. The fries are over here, the hamburgers over there. This is how you make a burger. And there's a structure in place and they can learn how to function within a structured environment. People want structure. Governance is about building the infrastructure around people so they can succeed and use their ability within the framework of that structure. Now, all right, now there's so much wisdom in what you're saying. Okay, I love it, I love it, I love it. But people, Bishop Smith, have been so wounded by structure, we actually think we don't want structure. They have a name for this. It's called anarchists. They have groups, Facebook gatherings, and all kinds, right? Clubs. <clears throat> Sometimes they make a club and call it a church. After they left the church, it came out of because they're so wounded. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, I just want to talk about this for a minute here, right? wounding from structure and balancing that part of the conversation with the healthiness that structure is designed to bring. Now, you know, this is a very sensitive topic for some people. Um, when I first started pastoring in the uh, Detroit area where I am today, 
there were people who came to our church, Dan, from other churches. And they wanted me to beat them up verbally. They didn't say it, but I perceived that they were accustomed to being abused. Their previous pastors had treated them so bad, they had succumbed and degenerated to the place where they thought what I would call spiritual abuse was love. And I had to set people down and say, listen, I don't govern like this. I respect you. I love you. We're going to have structure, but this is designed to empower you to be everything you're supposed to be. So my point is this, a female who's been abused by her, her husband or her mate over the years sometimes can associate abuse with care and, and it gets all twisted up in there some kind of way where if you don't do that, they'll see you as weak and they'll see you as non-caring and they'll provoke things to try to get you to do things like that. And that's how convoluted things can really become when a person has been abused. Um, church abuse, church hurt, all of those things, those terms that we hear so often says to me that people uh, have not been under what I would call just rule for so long that they are almost like a foster kid who comes into a home, you know, and they don't quite know how to act. My mother has fostered hundreds of kids and I've watched these kids come into the home mm. and uh, each one of them, you know, feel uh, dealing with abandonment, dealing with whatever their issues are. And you can see their behaviors have been formed by their former conditions. I really believe that uh, individuals who have been hurt and wounded in church or any organizations uh, need a lot of healing before they can function well in a proper government because many times they will misassociate or misconstrue that which is good with a former treatment and then react, you know, in that way. Uh, if you raise your hand at a foster kid, and I, and I don't say that in a demeaning kind of way, a kid that has been abused, let's use that term, Maybe I should have said it that way. Um, sometimes they think you're going to strike them when you could be reaching out to hug them. And I see the quality structure sometimes can be perceived as abusive by a person who's still looking at life through that lens. We've had people come in our church and reject structure because of they've been abused. And so I've set them down and we take them through a healing process because deep down inside, everybody wants structure. They want to feel secure. Governance makes people feel secure when it's done right. And some of those same people that rejected the government initially are now growing and thriving because of the government. So I don't think we should abandon it. We need to learn how to help people heal and overcome. On the other side of this, Bishop, you know, there is so much wounding. And I will say this. I think that spiritual wounds from the body of Christ go about as deep as, as wounds can go. Mm -hmm. I agree. Why, 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 would you, why would you agree with that statement? Because when you connect God to an experience coming from a spiritual leader, it wounds your spirit. It goes mm -hmm. deep within you. It's not just a surface kind of experience. If I associate God with this leader in this church and he tells me I'm cursed or, you know, I've seen stories, I've, I've been around in environments where spiritual leaders have done some things that, uh, you know, I'm sure heaven frowned upon. And it left people crippled for years because they connected God to it. If it was just a man, then we would have a better way of overcoming it. And so they have to find a way to overcome this spiritual thing, man. It wounds deep. Yeah. So, so as we develop this conversation, um, how do you look at the process of developing leaders? That's what I wanted to get to. All right. So, so let, let me say this, Dan. And, and I'm a springboard from what you just said. A number of individuals who have been wounded by governance, because that's the generation we're addressing, not only by spiritual leaders, but their parents and abandoned you know, situations. People are angry. I spent years angry with my father 
I spent years angry with my father because he wasn't there. So I get that mentality. But um, I think we must see the world, this is the church now, or really any leader, must see the world through a lens of its state of health as opposed to its morality, its state of morality. I think we should see the world through the lens of a state of health first, I should say, before we look at it through the state of morality. If we only see the world through the state of morality, we have one or two choices to condemn, to contain, to abuse, to destroy, to punish. And the church's public image, I think, needs to be fixed because people in the church are perceived by those outside the church as those that judge, those that are condemning, those that are abusive. That's what we get that from. But Jesus says, the whole need not a physician. I've come, I haven't come to call, you know, I've come to call sinners unto repentance, is what he said. So he likened himself unto a physician. I really believe the thematic content of the Bible and Christ Jesus views the world through the lens of health first, then the lens of morality. And so if I see it that way, then I become a healer. Mm. And if I'm leading people, I think like a healer before I think like a governor. I think like a healer because I'm dealing with people who are compromised in many kinds of ways. And if I only see them as wrong or right, holy or unholy, good or bad, then I have one or two tools to deal with them with, which will create an environment that will alienate a whole lot of people and probably abuse a lot of people. But before we make the judgments about people's morality, I'm concerned about healing them first. And that's the approach that I see the Lord taking. So that's a lens that I try to craft. I see myself as a lens crafter. And I didn't coin that phrase, by the way, <laughs> you know, lens crafter. <laughs> but I see myself as a lens crafter. And I try to teach our leaders to do the same. Our job is to help people see the world a certain kind of way. And one way that we have to see the world is as healers, see ourselves as healers first and the world as sick. Now, the scripture says in Isaiah, when referring to the nation, that the whole head was sick and there was no soundness from the head to the feet. Hmm. In the book of Malachi, I mean, it's all through the scriptures, but in the book of Malachi, when the Lord is dealing with the Israeli people after they came back from Babylonian captivity and they stopped paying their tithe and they stopped doing the religious ordinances. The first thing the Lord says is, I set as a refiner's fire to purify the sons of Levi. In other words, I'm going to burn out the impurities. The impurity is the disease or the sickness. I'm the fire and I'm going to purify them and heal them. Then it says that they may offer a sacrifice in righteousness. So when I get to healing them, they will be able to do the things they were supposed to do. So I think, again, it is almost abusive to expect the lame man to run fast or a blind man to act as though he sees. If I'm leading them, I have to heal them first. So we, have, we put a huge emphasis in our leadership teaching on learning to bring people into a place of wholeness as you're leading them. And people have the tendency to trust leaders that heal and lead simultaneously. See, that, that's so good. And, and this is where, you know, I, I think you helped me a lot because I, and, and folks, this, this is just a fact of the matter. I, for a long time, couldn't see how, how I could help people heal while simultaneously governing the environment, bride ministries. I thought it was either one or the other. And if I became a governor, then I couldn't heal and I would probably just start hurting people. And if I just say to healer, then I could avoid governing and then it'll be a safe place. <laughs> and this was the fundamental shift in logic that I had to walk out in myself where I realized that by removing myself as a leader from the seat of leader, the only thing that's gonna sit down in that seat is a counterfeit, but something's gonna sit in that seat. And if I'm not sitting where I belong, something else is going to sit where I belong. And that will produce 
pain and injury and hurt. And so thank you, Bishop Smith. Now, I'm, I'm going to let you respond to that. Yes, you're absolutely correct, Dan. Um, <laughs> if, if I abdicate the responsibility of leadership, and that's what it is, is an abdication of responsibility of leadership in the name of healing only, then I never set up the structure that perpetuates health and protect the rights of individuals and all the callings. That, you know, and you have to make tough calls as a leader. But if they see you as a healer who's leading, then, then they have the tendency to receive your rebuke, your corrections. I mean, just think of the Lord. He says he's a consuming fire. What is he consuming? He sits as a refiner's fire. He's mm. only consuming the germ, the impurities, the foreign substance, the things that shouldn't be apart, like a doctor addressing the germ, not trying to destroy the person. The church must be seen as healers. Leaders must be seen as, if I come after someone to correct them, I'm only trying to deal with what's hurting them and preventing them from going where they need to go. And so once that logic is kind of inundated within the house, then, then people receive you. You can, get, you can say all kinds of things to people to correct them and rebuke them and all of those kinds of things in a good way, in a healthy way, because they know you're going after what's ailing them. And I think the same thing is true in every community. The city can be sick. The nation can be sick. Wherever there's a germ, you know, the scripture says that there's a difference between sickness and disease. A sickness is that which is in decay. Mm. A disease is the full blooming of that decay. Mm. So, so one can have a, an, an offense in their heart, sickness. The disease could be rebellion. Wow. One can have an emotional uh, sickness called fear or, 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 or a spiritual, let's say, sickness called fear, but it can create panic attacks in their emotions. So if somebody's on my leadership team and they're having panic attacks and they're, and they're all these issues, my job is not just to govern them, but to heal them so they can offer and lead and operate at the right kind of level. We simply have to become healers while we're leading. All right, I need you to talk to these fathers for a minute here, Bishop. Now, talk about leading a family from the position of head according to the scripture. Yes. Leading through healing. All right, how does that apply in the family unit? Dan, I have three daughters, and I have three grandsons right now, and I am the father in this environment. And uh, I had to learn, uh, I grew up in an environment with, you know, brothers. So I wasn't around too many females growing up. We were male dominant family. So I had to learn, number one, um, as Peter says, um, you know, dwell with the wife according to knowledge. So I had to study. <laughs> you can't govern what you don't know. You can't <laughs> govern what you don't understand. You can't. It's impossible. Know them that labor among you. You have to know everything about because you can't provide and you can't create the kind of environment and you can't nurture what you don't understand. So I think as a father, a leader, we must study that which we are governing and we must understand its nature so we can properly nurture that. So in the context of, of a father, um, I, I absolutely invested myself in femininity and, and understanding how the female mind works versus the male mind. And uh, I learned some things over the years that I, I think has made me a better man and a better person and a better father. I haven't gotten it right all the time. But I, I had to understand, I, when I thought I was healing, I was hurting. Uh-oh. There were times when I thought I was benefiting when I wasn't benefiting at all because I was addressing the female as if it was maybe a male in terms of certain things. I didn't understand the mindset. So once I got my stuff, understood, you know, I got my understanding in place, I was able to govern better. I think people struggle with governing because they don't understand what they're governing. They just simply have no real knowledge of that which they're leading. I can only lead a person 
to where I've gone, but I can't even connect to them until I can enter into their world and see how they see the world. So I try to create two lenses for me every time I'm leading. I want to see through your eyes, so I got to craft the lens for me to see the world like you see the world. And once I do that, then I can craft the lens for you to see the world like I see the world, and now we can probably govern that person. Wow. Okay. Expanding out a little bit, let's talk about kingdom systems. Yes. When you think about kingdom systems, what are these? Jesus said upon this rock, I build my church. The very gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. So when we talk about the gates of hell, we're talking about the council of hell. Council meeting, strategies, whatever you want to call it. I'm sure you can help us with that, Dad. Yeah. There's a yeah. whole lot. Oh, they that. have a lot of councils, Bishop, <laughs> let me tell you. <laughs> That's my point. So there's a lot of council down there. And we know that is only mirroring what is in the kingdom of God. There, God's government is so sophisticated um, and organized and structured. So when we think of his government, I think of a grid. We talked about that before. Um, a grid allows us to channel the power of God to all the points where it is meant to go or allow people to be recipients of everything that God is doing. And I see the government of God or the systems connected to the government as that grid that allows those things to happen. Um, so I can have power, but if I can't put a system together, then I can't get the power to the recipient in the way that they need it, or I may overpower a recipient uh, because uh, my amps are too high for what they need. They turn the light on and I blow their house up or something. Uh, I think we need to create proper kinds of systems that allow the power of God to flow to all the places it needs to flow. And frankly uh, put, we, we start naming these systems. There needs to be financial systems. You know, we want to get detailed about it. Uh, there needs to be what I call uh, judicial systems. Uh, in a home, I'm, I'm, you know, we teach the people in our ministry that every home should have a judicial system, a financial system, and I've got about eight systems that every home should have that we talk about for every family. Because growing up, if the kids are having disagreements and arguments and things like that, and there's no way of settling that stuff, they go into adulthood with unsettled disputes, they go into adulthood with breaches in their relationship that sometimes can never be settled because they never dealt with it. And the house didn't show them how to deal uh, justly with one another. So I think in, in every house, be it a church house, be it the kingdom, be it the family, or be it your personal house, mm. you need systems to deal with all the facets of life. Then God can flow through you and bring healing. You know, the idea of the justice system is so good, right? Because here, here's the problem. If people grow up in a house where it's a scatter plot of justice. I mean, you might change the channel at the wrong time and get the belt that then, you know, you don't come home for three days and your mom's actually worried sick about you. And you're received with open arms. And there's no actual knowledge of when or how or how much punishment is going to be dispensed for any kind of thing. It's all arbitrary. Uh, this is the way it is with a lot of abuse situations where, you know, kids are getting smacked and hit. They don't even know why it's happening to them. And then they grow up. You might find Jesus, but some of these people end up pastoring a house. And... Well, they found Jesus, but what they didn't find is a system of justice. Yeah. And so now in the church, this person gets to get away with highway robbery, but that person gets the left foot of fellowship and there's no system. It's just how the pastor feels. Unfortunately, this happens in some situations. <laughs> what is your wisdom for setting up justice systems in the church and in the home? In the church specifically, I have a huge burden and passion for it, uh, to see it in the church and the home. 
Um, and let's start with the church. You know, we have a judicial system within our local assembly. And if someone has an ought with each other, there's one level of handling that type of dispute. If that doesn't work, it's elevated to another level where a third party is brought involved or a fourth party, a small committee, they try to resolve it. Then if that doesn't work, it's elevated to what we call the council. And we actually sit and we hear cases, we mediate. Um, what I found is that if you don't rule on a matter and you leave it open because you don't want to address stuff, then people walk away with their own ideas and their own thoughts, which destabilize everything because everybody needs allies. So whatever they believe, they're gonna get their company around them. And they're gonna get their company. You end up creating division within the church. The same holds true for the family. If there's no central judgment on a thing, then you allow them to conclude the justness or the rightness themselves which will bring division. And those divisions sometimes become so deeply rooted that you can never reconcile the house. They can actually divide a church, divide a house, divide a family. Many families are divided because no father ruled mm -hmm. on a matter. And sometimes men don't like to rule or a judge doesn't want to rule because they don't want to deal with the recompense or someone upset with them. But that's what leadership is all about. You have to be able to rule in the body of Christ. And I, and I say this respectfully, respectfully. There have been leaders who have publicly fallen, who had massive influence and nothing said. Absolutely nothing said. Now, should anything have been said? What should have been said? I'm not suggesting what, but because there was nothing said to the body, you have several young ministers rising and drawing their own conclusions and making shipwreck because this person did this, this person did this, and there's no judgments. There's no, and I say judgment, not in a negative sense. There's no ruling. There, there's nobody speaking to these things. I'm concerned for a nation that does not rule on what's happening in the nation because you create chaos and, and instability when you do that. The lack of judgment opens the door for confusion and chaos. People have an ideal of judgment as something negative. I'm not teaching it as negative. Judgment is simply doing what protects the rights of the individuals that are present. Doing, uh, making the right decision about what happened in the case so that righteousness can rise. Righteousness exalts a nation, mm -hmm. but the lack thereof will destroy and cause decay and confusion. And so anytime you see a lot of decay and confusion, it goes to me to the leadership. Nobody's taking a stand. Even if the leader takes a stand and they disagree with him, because he took a stand, it still holds it together. That's deep. So Daniel, we must rule on everything that happens or there is no governance. Moses stood all day and all night here in from the people uh, on, on matters that were civil and all of that, all day and all night, however long it was, his father-in-law said, this is unwise, find another way to do it. So they set up structures where they could do that. That is an essential part of leading. We must deal with disputes. Now, let's talk about finances. It, it has been suggested that there are more divorces over finances than adultery. The numbers vary. I see that finances can either be a blessing to a unit or an entity or the opposite. Now, um, what do you have to say about governance and finances? Well, um, the word accountability comes into mind right away. And when you speak of accountability, we're talking about holding people to task based on what was given to them, based on what was given. I can only account for what was given to who much is given, much is required. 
And that accountability process is everything has to go where it is. If this much comes in, this much goes out. So I see stewardship hmm. or accounting for every penny to have a balanced budget, to have a balance at the end of the day. You, we talk about finance, but we can talk about gift, talents, we can talk about time, we can talk about everything. At the end of every day, I have to do a, an accounting for my day. And if I can balance the books like a banker does, then I'm at peace and I can go to sleep at night. If the books are not balanced, inwardly I am restless and I'm disturbed and perturbed and it affects my personality, it affects my relationship. I think there are a lot of people walking around the earth who haven't learned to hold themselves accountable for balancing the books dealing with their talents, their gifts, their time, whatever it is, especially the older you get, the more you start subconsciously accounting for your time on the planet and you get angry at the world because you haven't done what you thought you should have done oh, no. and you lose your peace and you have to go get some help. You need a therapist <laughs> now and some medication because you don't have any peace. It really comes from the books being off balance. Hmm. The same principle holds true to financial uh, affairs. I think you have to account for everything that has come in. There needs to be a system in a family, a system in the church that actually accounts for everything and balances the books on everything every month or whatever the you know, uh, time periods are in order to have peace. The purpose of accounting is peace. Then you get increase when there's peace. If there's no peace, there's no increase. So husbands and wives have to buy into this accounting process, this budgeting process, and this peace that they need for blessing and increase. Why would God give me more if I'm not handling what I already have? He says, you've been faithful over a few things and I can make you ruler over some more. So I'll give you more, more blessing, more increase. I think the more peace we have, the more increase we're gonna have. And husbands and wives, I think, should buy into a system like that where they sign off. Now, if they violate that, now we're going to have an argument or we're going to be, have a dispute between ourselves. But if we agree to it and we hold to it, there's peace. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how I see it. I know I went around the world to get to your point, but, <laughs> but it, it, it's accountability and it's, it's stewardship and it's agreement to live like this. So I can't just say, hey, to my wife, you know, I'm going to go spend this money to do that. And it wasn't a part of the plan. It wasn't a part of the budget. It wasn't a part of the vision. I've messed up our peace. And I can't account for it at the end of the month. I have to get permission to disturb the system like that. And if she agrees, and then we say, okay, this is how we're going to compensate. And so at the end, we'll still have peace. Then it's our agreement. I can't do that alone and arbitrarily on my own because I'm the man. I can't do that. And this is why people are in conflict. But I think a lot of people are in conflict in marriage when it comes to finances is because they don't have a system at all. Many of them don't have any system in place and everybody's operating their own way. And, and then eventually they crash because there's no peace. They have a need that they can't satisfy and they blame each other for it. Oh my gosh. Now, I, I want to talk to you about marrying accountability to faith. Okay. Is faith balancing your monthly checkbook. I can't really use that. I, I just have to say bank account now because everyone uses debit card, credit card, and everything else. PayPal, swipe, and iPhone, um, Apple pay. Balancing your bank account every month against what you believe God is going to give you later. No, I don't ascribe to that, Dan. <laughs> I think... <laughs> I can only be held accountable to what is given. Uh -huh. And even though it's in the spirit, and maybe I need to convert it from spiritual wealth to, and I think that's possible to, to convert spiritual wealth into tangible monetary uh, uh, resources. I think that is possible. But until it's converted, I cannot make it a part of my accounting system in the natural. And I, I know, now, we just got through the building project, all right? And many times during the course of this project, we were, we were quote, in faith, trusting God. 
But every time we get in faith, trusting God, we're believing for God to bring revenue, but we can't account for that in the natural system. We deal with what's in the pot. Now, if we're gonna say we're gonna trust God with this, then we have to agree that we're gonna offset this system. If God doesn't come through, we agree to all go under together. <laughs> you know, that's what we're gonna do. You know, but I, I, I also believe that the same God that can work miracles on the back end can also work miracles on the front end and give you the money up front so you don't have to do that. And I've been on both sides of that equation where we've stepped out in faith and God has come through and also where God has come through and we didn't have to get a miracle at the end. But I, I love the way that you're kind of posturing this, um, this conversation because, you know, some people, they're like, all right, I'm going to live by faith, you know, and I'm going to make this investment by faith i'm married but i'm the man or i'm married but i'm the woman <laughs> you know what's yours is mine and what's mine is mine and so so they the, the investment gets made but there's no agreement to go under so someone said well i heard god so i just did it but the uh, but, but but your your hearing is is actually holding me hostage to a downfall if what you heard doesn't manifest. But that's not right governance. You're saying, well, if that's real faith and God really spoke, there has to at least be opportunity for agreement and buy-in. There has to be agreement there. Yeah, no, man. No agreement. You know, I'm the senior leader in our church, but if I don't have any agreement among our board, Believe it or not, very few times will I ever overrule everybody and say, we're just going to do this anyway. I will work with them until I get agreement. I will craft lenses, do what I got to do to get people to see what I see. But I'm not going to step out there without agreement because the enemy works in the place of conflict, confusion. Every wicked work mm. can open up where the agreement is lost. There has to be agreement. It's a biblical principle. Let me throw this one thing at you, too. I don't know how much time we have. Oh, we have time. On this program. Um, but I wanted to talk about one of the things that I think will benefit all leaders mm -hmm. and something that I work at and am working at now, and I'm shifting just a bit, um, and that is the word credibility. Whoa. Credibility. You know, we're talking finances, credibility. Uh, the, the ability to inspire confidence where people give me the benefit of the doubt, where I actually impart faith. Watch this. God gives to every man the measure of faith before you deal with him. He has to get you to trust him. So he puts the faith in you so you can trust him because we can't do anything in terms of leadership and following unless you believe and buy into the person. I believe, Dan that one of the greatest reasons that many things don't come to pass and governance fail is because of credibility. Sometimes we go retweak the system when something doesn't work and we think that's gonna fix it and it still doesn't work. Then we'll go do something else. The issue is they don't believe in you. When people don't believe in the leader, you can fix everything you wanna fix. <laughs> You can, you can do everything you need to do and it still won't work because of credibility. And I believe working on raising and increasing credibility is one of the most important things a leader can do because before they buy into your vision, before they buy into anything else, they have to buy into you. Even Jesus walked with his disciples and they didn't believe on him until the wedding at Cana. So that means they were walking with him, but they still was kind of scratching their head about this Jesus. After that miracle, he had done enough to get them to believe. And that's when things take off. When people believe in you, mm -hmm. Daniel Devall, when they believe in you, then everything in you can come forth at that time. And so many things will come to pass. But until that moment, you can perfect everything all you want, but it's their disbelief. If we want to look at the demonic world, 
I think the, one of his greatest assaults against the body of Christ in God is to try to create the loss of credibility among people and among God. I, I spoke in the book about Malachi. The whole book is about the nation of Israel losing confidence in God mm -hmm. and hope deferred. When I lose hope in a person, I have deferred hope or a sick heart. I become sick. Now I can't trust you. The light in my eye goes out. And you're talking all this good stuff and I'm just looking at you because I don't believe in you. So how do you restore credibility is something that we need to look at or not just restore, how do we increase credibility? And, and Malachi gives four ways to increase credibility that I think will benefit a whole lot of people, a lot of leaders. And I don't know if you want to go there or not. I'd love to. Give it, but, but give I, it to I, us, Bishop. Huh? What, what are, I said. Yeah, go ahead. What are the four ways? <laughs> to, you know, this is so good. This is so good. And, and, and let me just say this, right? Satan's name is the accuser. And the thing is, you know, people talk about, and there's a whole lot of revelation now about courts of heaven, which I love, and d dealing with the accusations, right? Uh, breaking the spiritual legalities that hold our lives and our families and our businesses in captivity and, and so forth. But, but I'd say the majority, the actual majority, of Satan's accusation job is aimed at this realm where he is accusing me to you and he's accusing you to me and he's using Sue or Pam or Jake to do it. Gossip, slander, libel, all this other stuff. There's accusations all over the place in every home. He accuses the wife to the husband and the husband to the wife. He just slams people with thoughts and fiery arrows like i bet you your spouse is doing this they said that to you because of this accuse accuse again and so the accusation realm is absolutely flooded and what does that do it destroys credibility so you are nailing something here that is very significant in my opinion i want to know <laughs> you, you know that i knew a, i knew a young lady who had a dream that her husband was committing adultery. And based on the dream, she was ready to divorce this guy. I said, wait a minute, how, how do we know that, that that came from God? It could have been your subconscious world rising because of your own fears. And, but she was convinced and began to treat him a certain kind of way. Oh no. Based off of a dream. So this issue of credibility is huge. You see it from the Garden of Eden to the Book of Revelation the destruction of credibility as Satan's means of disrupting the purpose of God in the earth. And so uh, one of the ways, one of the ways that I see in the, in the book of Malachi, and I'm using that book as, as the uh, model for us, or the modality that we're gonna use, um, is learning how to stand with each other. Um, what we call it, lending social capital. Um, there's an individual once who, struggled in some areas and he had lost credibility. And I came down to his church on purpose to stand with him. I felt I had some social capital I could spend in that area without damaging me. So I spent some social capital, stood with this individual and it raised the credibility in his house and he was able to survive a severe storm. So I think one way of raising credibility is having people around you who have credibility in an area that you need and they publicly stand with you. We need more of that in the body of Christ. Typically when people falter, people distance themselves. That's what you see in politics. We could be friends, but we're gonna distance ourselves if you're in trouble because I don't want your mud to get on me. But if we're brothers in Christ, uh, I think th there are appropriate seasons where we stand with one another, number one. And number two, there are times when a person hasn't faltered, but we just want to catapult them to another level. There are people at higher levels who should stand to raise a person's credibility. And I'm telling you, that's one way to do it. We need to lend each other social capital, number one. You respond to that, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
I, I'll tell you, um, it, it is, what you're saying is true. What you're saying is true. You know, uh, I, I think life is a team sport. Yeah. I, 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 I don't think that life is a, you know, one-on-one tennis match. It's you and the devil. It's, that's it. It's just you and him hitting the ball like no it's, it's it's a team sport and you need you need others and you know i i mean i went through a season personally and my, most of my listening audience knows this by now where i mean we came under heavy heat and attacks so organization i i got accused of everything <laughs> you know i'm sitting here on my podcast saying you know down with lucifer somehow i'm a luciferian all of a sudden it's like you know and i got emails people like how dare you become a luciferian dan Duvall? I was like how do get from here but it's accusation yes. and it, it it's misplaced and misguided and that's unfortunate but you know here i was at that stage in my journey i had a little bit of support but part of my vulnerability at that time was my lack of a circle of people that could actually stand alongside of me in that season it it was pretty sparse and so not that there wasn't anyone because there were some people but i mean um that was that was the major major vulnerability at the time was you know well who's saying something that's completely opposite to that that i listen to and believe and and you know well there's not a very big depth chart there so what you're saying i mean is such a big deal such a big deal and that's why you know god inspires relationship that's why there are you know he has people and you know like you're in my book i'm in your book god has written us in each other's books because there's a kingdom connection and with others as well and so brother Very good. the apostle paul didn't have anyone so barnabas was there when he first was converted the church didn't trust paul he had a credibility issue but barnabas helped open the doors for him to be who he is. And so if we don't have an environment where people believe in us and buy in us, you can be anointed, you can have every gift in the world, but it will not be released if the environment doesn't embrace you, especially the apostolic gift. The apostolic gift has to be received. Prophetic gift, okay, you can prophesy, they receive it or not, you get the word out of it. But the apostolic gift has to be received. So those that are apostles in the house, credibility means everything, and the enemy will do everything in this power to destroy credibility because it actually injures all of what God wants to do through you. Number two, I think we need credibility campaigns, and this is what I call it. I think we actually should organize credibility campaigns for individuals. You see it in the book of Malachi. The fathers will turn the hearts no, the, I, Elijah will turn the hearts of the father to the sons. Why does he have to do that? Because the father is upset with these sons. And I know we're dealing with father and ministry. We can be dealing with the fathers of the faith or the doctrines of the father, however you want to interpret that verse. But the bottom line is there was a credibility issue between fathers and sons. Mm. And someone, the spirit of the Lord, came upon a prophet to turn, to get them to see each other differently. Prior to Jesus being able to minister, John had to come in the same spirit to prepare the way and to prepare the hearts of the people so they could hear Jesus when he came. So he had a credibility, he had a need for a credibility campaign. Many companies and businesses spend millions of dollars on marketing. What is that? That's a credibility campaign, be it true or a lie. They're trying to get people to believe something about them so they can receive their product. And I think successful ministry successful companies successful relationships require someone outside of themselves speaking well you can't just keep blowing your own trumpet somebody else has to blow that trumpet for you and that's a campaign somebody has to turn someone's heart towards you and god says he can turn the heart of the king for you or against you once a person's heart is there they believe in you then anything is possible in that environment and I'm just sensing there's some people that are watching this, Dan. I am sensing that there are some leaders that have lost some credibility oh. that are watching this program that, that actually need someone to stand with them and they need a credibility campaign. And they're thinking about giving up on what God has called them to do. But they heard this word and God is saying, don't give up. God is going to raise up some people around you and he's going to enable you to restore that credibility 
and even advance upon where you once were. And I really sense that in the Holy Ghost. And so I want to release that in the name of Jesus. Amen. We agree. Amen. Number three, number three, that there needs to be some change. Um, uh, sometimes we lose credibility because something's wrong with us. And, and in any relationship, if something's wrong with the person that you're dealing with and they never acknowledge it, and they never, if they don't acknowledge it, they can't change, then you lose hope. We can be going through something and, and, and you, you and I, and we're working together and, I, and, and you see something in me and, and I'm not willing to acknowledge it, then you're stuck with dealing with a person that won't acknowledge this issue and inwardly you're gonna lose hope because you know we can't go anywhere. So number one, we have to own our mistakes. Credibility can be restored if I just own what's wrong with me. Yes, I am. I do good. I miss that. And then there's a plan for my transformation. Now, hope is restored. Credibility is simply a person having hope in you, hope in what you're able to do. Hope is restored when I acknowledge my faults, when I acknowledge what's wrong, and I have a plan to overcome. So I think there needs to be a transformation of the person that can also restore credibility. And then number four, finally, you got to get some victories. <laughs> Some low hanging fruit, man. You got to win. You got to score a few touchdowns. You got to get some victories. So if I get some victories, if I transform and acknowledge a few things in my life, if I get a campaign going and some other people speaking for me and have some people stand with me, you can restore hope to an environment and they can believe in you. Then at that point, anything is possible. And I don't think Satan has any weapon against those four things. That's so good. That's real good. Oh my gosh. Um, it, mm, mm, mm. Okay. When it comes to bringing lasting change, lasting change in various systems, what are some of the strongest barriers and challenges you've identified? to bringing lasting change mm. in a system. I do a teaching on sustainability. I do all these abilities. <laughs> you <laughs> love your abilities. Accountability, oh, sustainability, <laughs> adaptability. There's a whole lot of them out there. But lasting change <laughs> deals with sustainability. And, and we have to be able to sustain over a period of time. I've found in my time of working with people, again, the culprit for short-circuiting dreams and things dying prematurely or the spirit of abortion or whatever, you know, something not going long-term or living out his lifespan. In a corporation setting or organization setting, sometimes we don't identify the expected lifespan, number one of a thing. So when, you know, when a kid is born, you know, we think it's at least 70 or 120, depends on what you ascribe to. There's a lifespan for every project, everything that you do. So we try to declare the lifespan up front. This should be around for this amount of time. Now, what must we do? Everything is health to me. Everything is health. What must we do? What could cripple the lifespan here? What kind of germs and diseases can come? We talk about stuff like that. And what, what do we do? What do we must, what kind of nutrients must we feed this thing so it can live out? And what kind of governance does it need? Justice, so it can be peaceful and increase and live out its lifespan. What I find that prevents things from ending out their lives or, or living out their full lifespan has everything to do with no governance again, lack of governance, lack of vision and thought around what you're doing, just haphazardly doing things, man. Uh, <laughs> the the what do they call that rate uh, when we talk about children that die uh, the mortality rate oh. in, in certain ethnic groups is a lot lower than other ethnic groups in the same country but the question is why because environmental conditions Environmental conditions can shorten the lifespan of anything. Toxic environment, man. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's a governmental issue again. That's deep. Do you think so? Toxic that's environments? Oh my God. It's like, what? 
Yeah. But you're so right. Yes. Toxicity. And, 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 and you know where you find some of the most toxic environments is actually in the business world. There are businesses that could be thriving, but the management of the thing is so toxic that people aren't thinking through their systems and their employees aren't being really equipped with the best way of doing things and everyone has low morale and it's just bringing things to a grinding halt. People are hiring moral and motivational speakers and all of that to come into their businesses to try to keep people up. So the, quite, so, so the inference is people are down. Right. <laughs> so, so why do we have to get all this up? People are down because of their home life. They're down because of all kinds of reasons. And sometimes it's the governance, it's the environment at the job site that is so toxic that people, you know, uh, choose not to work there. They'll work for less pay somewhere else that they enjoy and they can breathe. So on earth, we need oxygen mm. to live. Every environment needs a certain kind of oxygen to breathe and to live and to grow. And when that stuff is not conducive to the people there, it shortens lifespans. Uh, and, so, and, and that's to me the systematic uh, uh, setup of, of that particular place uh, is, is kind of the metaphor. You know, I'm, I'm using this as a metaphor of how things are set up. People can be discouraged. Goodness. You see so many uh, parallels in our relationship with God. Yes. And, and so I like to use my relationship with God and try to take that example and then establish the same kind of relationships with human beings. He tells us to love people as he's loved us or to treat people like he's treated us. So I simply just try to transfer the environment and I'm finding people remember how you make them feel more than anything else. If they don't feel good in your environment, man, you could be preaching the paint off the walls <laughs> in a church setting, <laughs> or you could be having the greatest wisdom or whatever it is, body to be burned, Corinthians chapter 13. But if there's no love and no kindness and not the right atmosphere, they won't return. Unless they are addicted to something, then you're coercing them. But for the most part, if, they are, if they're free moral agents and they can get away and making the choices that are theirs, they won't return. Nobody wants to be in an environment that makes them feel bad. Come on. Nobody does. Come on. And to say, well, you need to be faithful and you need to, and you know, I think that's abusive too. Ah, you just stepped on someone's toes. <laughs> yeah, so tell somebody to be faithful to something that's destroying them is, is, <laughs> is misrepresenting God and it's abuse. It really is. Wow. I'm an advocate for every human being mm. to live out their eternal purpose in an atmosphere that is, that is just and right, that allows them to flourish. And I'm an idealist. That's the way it's supposed to be. Now, we don't, we don't see that, but that's what the ministry is all about, trying to create that and addressing those who sabotage and, 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 and create you know, contrary uh, environments to destroy. Well, but this is the thing, you know, and, and, and you, know, uh, you have these individuals and I mean, it's just like everyone abandons me, everyone rejects me, I, you know, all this accusation, right? Sitting there, but they themselves are a toxic environment for those that try. So yeah. you come near this person with some good news. Hey, you know, I got a new job today. Oh, that'll never work out. <laughs> Smack, you know, it's like, all right, that was toxic. It's like, hey, uh, would you like to take a walk and hang out? Like, no, it's just going to rain. You know, it's like beautiful outside, clouds in the sky, but it's, it's always a rainy day in their life. It's toxic. And so people they get very, very accusatory because like everybody's this. But the toxicity level of their lives is through the roof. And, and, and where does that come from? Sick. They're sick. Right. They're they need sick. healing. Delivery. They need healing. They need what we do. They, they are sick. And so we receive them in that 
light and we can love them and we can nurture them. And there are three things that and I would like to leave you with and people with three things that can heal the sick. We said it's the fire of God, the purifying fire. Okay. But what does that really look like? You know, and, and just let me say this uh, for the record. Every believer must be on fire. Our human spirit is, is a fire. It is a fire. Angels are flames of fire. Come on. God is a consuming fire. And fire is a pure, it purifies. It, it address, holiness strikes out at the disease. Sin is a disease. It's coming short of what we were meant to be. You know, if you only look at it from a moral point of view, you see it as a wrong thing. But it's really something that made me less than what I was meant to be. So it's a disease. That's why holiness strikes out at it. He's not trying to hurt us. The religious veil or lens calls us to see everything as God is judging me in a negative light. No, he's trying to get that out of me that's crippling me. He wants me to be healed. So the fire of God requires three things. Number one, his will or his judgments. Anytime a person receives the judgments of God or the will of God, whatever he wills for you to do, that part of you will start burning. His judgments are fires. When he judges something, fire comes out. So anybody, anybody who, who receives his will or his judgments, they will burn and something will purify inside of them. Second thing, if they receive his truth, the truth, those disciples walking on the road to Emmaus for seven miles and they talked with Jesus, they said, didn't our hearts burn within us as we walked along the way? Uh, Jeremiah says, it was like fire shut up in my bones. So the word of God is a fire. Mm. Truth is a fire. So if I can embrace the truth about myself, the truth about my environment or whatever I'm dealing with, truth is hard to swallow. But if I ever get it in, it's, it's like an antibiotic. It'll burn something. It'll cleanse something. And then finally, his love. He loves us with a burning fire. And, and he, he's jealous over us. And that word jealousy means he burns for us to be what he created us to be. It's not the human kind of jealousy. So if people receive the love of God, they'll be set on fire. If they receive God's will or his judgments, they'll be set on fire. If they receive the truth of God, they'll be set on fire. So when I'm dealing with people, I try to get them to embrace that part of God. And it starts to burn up some of the toxicity in them. Mm. And they start healing in many ways. We have to appropriate it in a lot of different places. But the reality is, if you resist God's will, if you resist the truth, if you resist his love, then you open yourself up to all kinds of germs. Come on. Bishop, we could talk all day. Uh, but <clears throat> here we are. That is really, really good. And so we're just going to let that be the final word. You have an incredible church up in Michigan. I'm going to let you uh, tell the folks a little bit about it if they happen to be in the area. Um, and, and, and by the way, folks, his personal website is hughdanielsmith.com. Uh, tell us about your church. We are at 195 Lad Road now, and that's in Wald Lake. It's one of the uh, suburbs of Detroit, Wald Lake, Michigan. And we're going to have our first Sunday there, actually this 17th, new facility. But our church is a non-denominational church. We're a kingdom-minded church. Um, we believe in deliverance, inner healing. We believe in five-fold ministry. We, I believe I'm called to the gifted. I'm called to people who are gifted in Christ. And so we try to nurture and release the natural leadership of the body of Christ. Uh, I think we have an outstanding ministry. And uh, I would love for people to come and see us. And you know, we were a word-based church. And it's all about making people everything God dreamed for them to be and creating the kinds of environment for those things to happen. Also, uh, uh, in my personal practice, we're doing now what we call a redemptive justice practice, where I sit with people one-on-one -on -one and we try to help them find healing through uh, using the redemptive work of Christ in specified areas of their life. And, and we're getting some, 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 uh, some victories in some people's lives by applying the principles of the scripture, praying for people, prophesying over them, showing them who they are in Christ, all of those things. People are getting healed when they receive his will and those things we talked about. So. I would love to meet many of you. Well, there it is, folks. Uh, HughDanielSmith.com. Uh, Bishop, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for uh, giving us some of your time. We so appreciate you. And folks, until next time, God bless and Godspeed.
You've been listening to Discovering Truth with Dan Duvall. Be sure to subscribe to our channel, like our video, and share this with friends. This podcast is a production of Bride Ministries International. Visit our website at brideministriesinternational.com to enjoy the Bride Ministries Church, the Bride Ministries Institute, free resources, and to support us financially.